one of America's great men of God and the world's, I might add, evangelist, Arthur David Wilkerson. I don't take myself too seriously anymore, but I do take God seriously. I take him very seriously. And some people have told me, David, why don't you lighten up a little bit? You're too sober. You can't spend time with him and hear what heaven says. Anybody, there's nobody can be shut in with him and come out and not feel the, the soberness of his presence and especially what he intimates to the heart that may happen or will happen. I, I've never, I don't believe I'm a prophet because the Lord's not shown me that, but I think my role is like Amos, a shepherd who occasionally prophesies. And I do have a prophecy this evening, and my role is simply to deliver it and ask no questions. And I do that so that he'll speak to me again. Because if I don't obey him, then the heavens are shut in that particular direction. He'll never shut me out. But when he shares the secret of his heart, he'll have to choose someone else. I want to say something about uh, Jimmy Swigert Ministries. Like I spent a, quite a bit of time this past year traveling in Bible schools and colleges and university speaking, and I was shocked at what I found, the coldness and the death and the covetousness. And this is one of the few schools, one of the few where I found God at work. There's a tremendous Bible college here, and any students that are watching, I, I, this is one of the very few that I would recommend because I've been to many of them. And I went home after a tour and said, honey, I can't believe what I've seen and heard. It's a coldness and death and, and young people who are disillusioned and don't know where they're going. I had hundreds tell me, I don't know where I'm going, I don't know what I'm doing. These are Christian schools. This ministry... I think, too, is one of the few where true prophets of God, like Brother Ravenhill, are welcome. Brother Leonard Ravenhill, 78 years old, he wrote Why Revival Terry, Sodom Had No Bible, some of the great prophetic books of all times. He's my neighbor and dear friend. I meet with him twice a week, and for hours we do nothing but talk about Jesus. And he's like Jeremiah. He's a real Jeremiah of that cloth. He's been watching Brother Swaggart on, uh, on television and rejoicing. And about a month ago, he said, David, if Jimmy ever asked me to come, you tell him I'd like to come. God help this ministry when prophets are not welcome or feared, or worse yet, when prophets refuse to come. That's when Ichabod is written on the doors. God help. I've, I've seen ministries go that way, and this ministry, I don't believe, will ever go that way because I want you to join me in prayer that, see, I'm not afraid of any Jimmy's adversaries outside. Don't even consider them. They have nothing to do with the gospel. They can't touch it. They can't kill it. They can't destroy it. It's just, there's nothing else. <laughs> My great burden is for a dear friend and your friend, and I'm not flattering Jimmy Swaggart right now. I'm telling you from my heart, we need to pray because he's the only enemy from within, that the time will never come that he becomes so busy he can't be shut in with God. Now, I know for a fact that he's, he walks 48 miles a morning speaking to God. And worst, one thing the devil wants to do is man, one thing is get him so busy. That's all. No woman, no money. Just take him away from the prayer chamber. So he no longer stands with that fire in his soul. And you need to stand in prayer that all the forces of hell will back away and say, leave him alone. Leave him to God. Lord, do that, I pray. Do that for him in a mighty way. Let him be one of the few voices left in America who thunders his voice and we know there's a man that's shooting with God. Give him that time, Lord. Hallelujah. My wife Gwen is with me. 
the Lord's healed her, and she's. We've 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 rejoiced in our uh, uh, fellowship. Uh, you know, a lot of people pray. I don't like to do this. Uh, she's sitting down in a pink. Just turning. Uh, honey, just stand up so that people can say hello. They've been praying for you. You, I, you, I promised I wouldn't do it, but I'm going to break my word. Uh, honey, God bless you. <laughs> Doesn't look like she's had 25 years of cancer and uh, all those diseases. The Lord's been good. The prophecy. Oh, I hate to. What happens to me when God moves the price on the physical body and sitting in a church meeting like this and God's moving and I'm having to fight with the flesh that I... Lord, I'll obey you tonight. This is a cry against the wickedness of American youth. Lord, I spent my last 28 years on the streets and talking and praying and loving our American youth, but now, Lord, I've got to prophesy against them. Lord, I'm not prophesying against the Christian young people. I'm prophesying against the wicked. Lord, I know I got this from your throne. I didn't dream this up. God, you put it in my heart in that private throne room. Jesus, you came to my heart and you said, if you love my people, you'll preach the truth and not be afraid. And if you love these young people, then tell them my truth. Lord, help me tonight. There's nothing fantastic, there's nothing new about this, but Lord, we just see it, just put it out. Oh God, more than anything else, we want to hear from heaven. We want to know that you're talking to us. Lord, all through Israel, all through the Bible, it says, and God said, and God said, and God said, and we see you speak to men of old. And then we see in the New Testament, Peter and Paul, and the Lord said, and the Lord said, and the Lord said, and Lord, we want to be able to say tonight, and the Lord said, and we heard from God. Thank you, Lord. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for the wickedness has come up before me. Jonah 1, 2. Prophet Malachi. Behold, the day is coming that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yes, and all that do wickedly shall be a stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them all up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. First John 5:19. The whole world lieth in wickedness. The whole world lieth in wickedness. Hosea 7, 2. And they consider not in their hearts that I remember all their wickednesses. They are always before me. They forget that I know all about their wickedness, and it's always before me. If you think only our goodness is before God, no, he said their wickedness is before me at all times. Now, what does God have to say about the immorality of American young people? The same thing he said to Nineveh centuries ago, I've had enough. Go to them and cry out against their sins. Warn them that my fiery wrath is to fall on them, and a great destruction is soon to happen unless there is widespread total repentance. Now, Nineveh was a great city. It took three days to walk from one end to the other. 120,000 children in that city who did not know from the right or the left foot. But it was so wicked, so violent, it had become so corrupted, it was so evil, God could take it no longer. He said, I'm going to wipe it off the face of the earth. Just one prophet was sent, one man, one evangelist. His name was Jonah. He rented no auditorium. He had no musicians. He handed out no literature. He didn't even have a loudspeaker, let alone television or radio as we have today. He planned no follow-up. There was this one street preacher walking straight through the city, stopping to talk to no one, ignoring all the government leaders, walked right past the temples and the universities, up past the bars, the brothels, walked past the prostitutes, up past the sodomites and the homosexuals and lesbians. And he was crying and shouting at the top of his voice. And he wasn't preaching the love of God. He wasn't telling them God had a beautiful plan for their life. He told them, it's all over. It's over. You've got 40 days left. Can you hear a single voice screaming in those streets? 40 days. God is...
you seen your wickedness? Judgment, 40 days. He was not preaching repentance, he was preaching judgment. It was only when they repented that God changed his mind, the Scripture says. He repented. Now, it didn't matter how many prophets would have walked those streets the same time Jonah walked them, trying to pacify the people. There could have been 10,000 preachers walking those streets with Jonah, preaching peace and prosperity, drawing multitudes away from Jonah, telling the Ninevites the country was too great that God, could send, that God would send judgment on them. It would make no difference to God at all because Jonah had the message from God. And while all the others were crying peace and safety, this prophet cried judgment. Now, there are many preachers in America preaching judgment now. But if there was only one voice, God would be justified and have to send no others. If Jimmy Swagger were the only man left on television preaching judgment, that's all God needs. It's always been one man, one voice. Crying in the wilderness, repent, judgment is coming. It's always been that way. What kind of a prophet would Jonah have been if he ignored God's hot passion against the wickedness of that city and he'd preach a soothing, soft message to those crowds? How easy it would have been for Jonah to grab the national flag of Nineveh, prayed it through the throngs as they clapped and cheered. How easy it would have been to applaud and congratulate the leaders of that city. Talk about their founding fathers. And that's the kind of soft, sweet preaching American people like to hear now. We wrap ourselves in the American flag. And we smugly prophesy from our pulpits today that our country's too great, our leaders are too moral, our God is too good. America could never be judged. You tell me why God's going to spare America from judgment. Tell me. Give me one reason. Are all the sodomites and the lesbians and the sadomasochists and the rapists, are they going to repent and turn to God in humility? Is one of them going to do it? Are our government leaders in Washington and in our state houses going to put sackcloth on them and sit in ash heaps and in godly sorrow repent for their drunkenness and their covetousness and their corruption? Do you see any government leader doing that? Are the American people going to suddenly become brokenhearted for their sins and confess that they have forgotten God and sitting before idols and worshiping sex and sports? You tell me God's going to spare us because we're missions-minded? We spend more money for dog food right now than we do for missions, and the money that is spent for missions is coming only from a whole small handful of God's people and not from the nation. You say, God's going to spare America because we're so charitable to poor nations? That's a farce. We have given less to starving children than we have spent on a single battleship. You say we're good to Israel. We're just as good to Syria, or, or, or rather to, to Arabia. We have given billions of dollars of armaments to Arab nations enough to bring on Armageddon. Give me one reason why God should spare America. Other than those who pray and repent and God saying, I'll give you space and time to repent. That's it. We're a wicked people in America now. We're overrun with sodomites. We're reeling in the streets from drunkenness. We're the most drug-crazed nation on earth. And no man can stand in his pulpit and tell you more knowledgeably than I can about that. There's not a nation in the world more drug crazy than America. Not one. God's not impressed by our Olympics or by our patriotism. He's not going to be pacified with all the whitewash coming from our pulpits. We're a violent nation now. A nation that's so numbed by the horrible news coming over television of our children being molested. An 87-year-old woman who was arrested for a child care center molesting both boys and girls, 87 years old. Child abuse, child beating, abortion. Not a street in America safe to walk on. Not a house is secure from robbers. Not a store that's not been harassed by shoplifters and thieves. To our young people now, violence is a way of life. 
Our big city schools are now installing metal detectors to detect the weapons and the knives of the kids coming in. A boy told my son who passed us in Detroit, he was walking the streets, he said, Mister, we used to fight our enemies. We don't fight them anymore. We shoot them or knife them now. Millions of our young people are dying. Suicide, knife down, gun down, overdosing. Our young people are fed up with their cheating, unloving parents, drunken dads and stoned mothers. Kids so confused by their divorcing parents, so confused by dead churches, so confused by humanistic churches, they said, we're going to turn sleazy just to get even. And so those kids are so down, they have to do anything to get up. And I'm a loyal American, and I love my country, and I salute the flag, and I pray for our leaders. But I'm also a man of God, and I pray. And I hear an awesome sound of a gathering storm, and I hear the thunder of God ringing in my soul. And the Spirit cries out that America is wicked, and the cup of wrath is filled. Now, he does not speak for God. The man does not speak for God who predicts America is going to be spared judgment. The Bible said all the elements are going to melt with a fervent heat. And John in his revelation said, all nations have been deceived. All have drunk of the wine of his wrath by their association with Babylon. Malachi prophesied, the day is coming, it shall burn as an oven, the wicked shall burn as stubble. The day that cometh will burn them all up. Revelation 18, 23, for by sorceries were all the nations deceived. All the nations deceived. Zechariah goes on to give a chilling account of a hydrogen holocaust. Frightening account from Zechariah. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. Their eyes will consume away in their holes. And tongues will consume away in their mouths. Now God has a very clear answer to why he's pronouncing judgment on America. It's the same answer he gave Israel. Now it shall come to pass when you shall show this people all these words. And they shall say unto you. For what reason has the Lord pronounced all this great evil against us? What is our sin? What is our iniquity that we've corrupted ourselves against the Lord God? You say God is going to judge us? Why? What's the sin? The answer? Because your fathers have forsaken me, saith the Lord, and have walked after other gods, and have worshipped them, and have forsaken me, and have not kept my word. And then Jeremiah goes on. I earnestly protested against your fathers. I sent prophets rising early to protest against them, saying, Obey me, obey me. Yet they refused to obey me, but they walked everyone according to their own imagination. Well, that's part of the trouble. That's part of the reason. It's the sin of our fathers. And it's true that godless parents are much to blame. He said, You're raising strange children. Strange, the prophet calls them. Your children are only corrupt. They're strange. There's a whole generation of strange children now. God says there's a conspiracy in the land with these strange children. There's a unique, unbelievable conspiracy that's never existed before. He said your parents have a... The, the, the God of your parents is their belly. And he said your parents worship idols. And we know idols today of sex and sports and success. Listen to God's indictment against the children, the young people. And this puts a chill on my spine. You have done worse than your fathers. For behold, you walk everyone after the imagination of his own evil heart, so you will not even listen to me. Therefore, I'm going to have to cast you out. This conspiracy is found among you. You are going back to the sins of your father, and you surpass them. And I will bring evil upon you, and you will not escape. And then God goes on saying, I'm not blind. He said, my eyes are upon all your ways. They're not hid from my face. Your sin is not hid from my eyes. David said, when I sin, I sin before the eyes of God. Go ahead and find the most secluded spot you can to have your sex. Go ahead in the most secluded, unknown area to stick the needle in your vein. God says, I see everything. Not one of your sins hidden from my eyes. I see it all. 
You have the idea that I don't see. Your wickedness is ever before me. Then God says, I want to explain to you now why there's such emptiness in you, such boredom, such loneliness. He said, because I've taken away my peace from you. I've taken away my loving kindness and my mercies. I've taken away because your cup of iniquity was too full. And think of it. God is saying to American young people, your fathers were bad enough. They forsook me. They once loved me. They once worshipped me, but they've turned to idols. They're godless. They're sinful. They've turned to idolatry. But you, you young people, you out your evil parents. You appraise your mad. You indulge in everything your imagination can conjure. You won't even listen to preachers anymore. You've hardened your heart. You've closed your ears. You're becoming so corrupt, so wicked. I am forced to move against you. I'll just warn you, then I'll judge you. Now, I'm not about to suggest all of our young people are wicked. Of course not. Thank God there's a despised few that will not bow their knees to Baal. There's a growing number. The righteous are becoming more righteous and the wicked are becoming more wicked. There are two streams. This remnant that I mentioned last night, growing eagle's wings. And they're sitting with Christ in heavenly places, giving up the world. And I've been prophesying, and I prophesied the last time I was here, and I've been prophesying in a message called the wall of fire, that the holiest generation of all is yet to come. God, in the midst of all the hell and everything else, is going to raise up a holy, sanctified young people. They're going to have more grace than I could have ever conceived in my generation, should the Lord pray. There's going to be a wall around them, bigger, stronger, and it's going to confuse the devil. The devil will be confused and I don't even get to them because of the wall of fire and the glory of the Lord that's within the wall. They're going to have the fire and the glory. Oh, but this other stream, many of them in that stream being sucked away now that once walked with God, backslidden, cold in heart. My message is for you. God must ju judge this generation of American young people or submit to the power of the devil. Now, I want you to listen. God blew me away on this. And he said, this is the point of your message. This is, this is the point of the sword. God cannot and he will not permit Satan to overcome entire segments of society. He never has. In all of the world's history, God has never allowed the devil to take over and rule entire segments of society without judging them quickly. Nineveh was a large segment of their population of the day. Young people represent a very large segment of our society. And God will not sit idly by and permit the devil to take over the young population without abdicating his power and authority. Do you know what God was doing through the lips of Jonah? He was not only preaching to the people of Nineveh, he was preaching to the devil and all of hell. He sent Jonah, just as sure as he sent him through the streets of Nineveh, he sent him through the confines of hell. He was not only preaching in Nineveh, he was preaching through hell. His message thundered through hell. And it was God saying to the devil, Satan, 40 more days. You can hold this city in 40 more days. Your time is up. I am tired of you rising up. You cannot hold this population. I'm going to wipe your power, your influence off the map. Spiritual warfare is not a cliche. It's very real. And the battle today is not parents against young people. And listen, young people, the battle is not between you and God. This is a battle between God and the devil. And the devil's using you as a pawn in this battle only to establish a kingdom for himself. He's not interested in you. He's interested in his power. He's trying to get at God. And how frightful to be caught up in the judgment of God against the devil. And you have to be a part of God's judgment on Satan because you've become his child. God's prophesied that he will not sit by and let the devil take a whole segment of our society to drugs, another segment to alcohol, another segment to pornography, another segment to the occult. God will not sit by. If he did, you and I as Christians would have to sit down and say, God can, the devil can mock our father. The devil can just take as he chooses. 
He can do what he pleases, sweep our young people away, and our hands are tied. He can establish his kingdom here on earth. And that's not what my Bible says. My Bible says, God said, I will come near to you in judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers. That's the drug pushers in the original Greek. I'll come against every drug pusher. I'll come against the alcoholics and against the adulterers. Malachi 5, 3, 5. That's God's word. I'll come against them. Bring them down. Glory to God. God's not about to abdicate this generation to the hands of the devil. He's going to rescue a remnant. Hallelujah. And when he does come, the devil's going to be powerless when he does. He's not coming against a powerful devil. He's coming back against a lion that has no teeth. I've always believed I serve a God that made Satan toothless and powerless against God's people. Nineveh repented at one sermon. It's incredible. The king, in fact, got the message secondhand. One of his servants came in and he said, There's a man, sir, running down our streets telling everybody we got 40 days left. He said, The man said we're all going to die because we're wicked. And the king said, Run that by me again. He said, There's a man, a Hebrew, a hated Hebrew, running our streets and he's He's got the whole city sturdy saying, we've got 40 days left, we're all going to die. And the king didn't laugh. And the court didn't laugh. And the princes didn't laugh. The king stood ass and white. And the congress stood ass and white. Because deep in their heart they were made to know that God would not sit by and let them become wicked and mad animals and kill and destroy and plunder. They knew it. That king stood at that moment, made a decree, every dog and cat, every cow and horse, every man, woman, boy and girl must fast. All government, all business, all transportation shut down. Not a single person moving. No activity at the threat of your life. No one moving about. Everybody to your houses. Everybody to your knees. Humble yourself was the cry. Confess your sins. Call on God. Maybe, just maybe, God will repent of what he said about us. Maybe we won't die. Maybe he'll have mercy on us. They didn't even have a promise of mercy and they repented. <laughs> Compare that to what's happening in America. Compare it. Oh, you smug... American people are going to hide behind American flag and patriotism. You listen to it. I'm just as patriotic as you are, but I've heard God's thunder. If you compare that one message with one man and even getting it second hand, even the animals are covered in sackcloth. And you compare that to America and what's happening 24 hours a day cable television shouting the gospel from rooftops, evangelists and prophets and pastors and teachers, street witnessing teams, begging sinners to repent, warning of the judgment that's come. They heard one man, they heard one sermon, one chance. We have thousands of preachers inundated with tons of Bibles and literature and magazines and books and radio and television and newspapers, everyone sounding alarm and hardly anyone listening. Because I called you and you refused. And I stretched out my hand you wouldn't listen. You wanted nothing to do with my truth and you didn't want to hear my warnings anymore. So your destruction is going to come upon you like a whirlwind. Suddenly your fear is going to come as desolation. Then you'll call on me, but I'll not answer. You'll seek me then, but you won't find me because you despised my threats, my warnings, and you turned away. And your turning away has destroyed you. Now, those of us who preach like that are called doomsday preachers. We're laughed at mostly by so-called ministers of the gospel who accuse us of preaching law, of not understanding the mercy and grace of God. We're told that we just scare people and we look only on the dark side. But I tell you, that doesn't matter anymore. Doesn't matter. God is love. 
But He's also holy. God wants you to be more than happy. He wants you to be holy. A woman wrote to me the other day, and she goes to a, one of the success churches where the pastor preaches nothing but peace and prosperity and success. By the, young, by the way, young person, if you were hanging over a fiery ledge about to fall in a pit and you're just hanging by a root and that root's about to be uprooted, you don't want some preacher leaning over saying, don't worry, everything's all right, everything's peace and quiet, success, everything's fine, you're not going to get hurt. No, you want a man of God to throw your rope and say, grab it! lady wrote to me and she said, all my friends are telling me that the suffering in my life is a tragedy and that I should not be suffering, I should not be sick, I should be having no unpaid bills. And she said, they come at me from all sides, make me feel like I'm not even a Christian. She said, I just got sick of it the other day and I just stood up and said, I know he wants me to be happy, but he also wants me to be holy. Glory to God. Hmm. You know, that's another message. I'm not going to get in on that. I'll let Jimmy finish that one. If Ananias and Sapphira dropped dead in a Holy Ghost church, where under a day of grace where love was being preached, then what's going to happen when God begins to pour out the wine of his wrath? Hmm. The Bible says the men of Nineveh are going to rise up and condemn this young generation. The men of Nineveh are going to rise up and condemn and judge this nation. Jesus said it. The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and they will condemn it because they repented with the preaching of Jonah and behold a greater than... Jonah is here, and in the supernatural realm in which God moves and has his being, I hear multiplied thousands of departed souls crying out, Oh God, if you will not destroy them, why did you destroy why, why would you destroy any society? We repented at one sermon. We had one preacher, not even a Bible, not a song was heard. Oh God, where is your justice? If you will judge a nation after one message, how could you not judge them after they've turned away from an ocean of appeals? And I hear the multitude damned souls of Sodom and Gomorrah who stand in the judgment saying, Justice, God! Justice! We were damned for less! Justice! And He is a just God! We had no preacher, we had no Bible, we had no television, we had no radio, we had no Jonah! We had no swagger, let alone the armies of ministers. How can you be a just God and consume and judge us and not judge them? Now, how can you figure that out? If you don't believe anything else, else just put on your thinking cap. If he's a just God, think of it. You hear what Jesus said? They repented in Nineveh. And you've had a greater than Jonah. And if you believe what Jesus said, he said, anyone who's in the kingdom of Christ is greater than John the Baptist. That means when Billy, when Billy Graham preaches, Jimmy Swaggart preaches on the anointing of God, it's a greater than Jonah. It's a greater than Jonah because of the Holy Spirit being poured out upon all flesh. I don't know what would have happened in, John, in, in Nineveh if a man who was in the kingdom realm had walked those streets. I don't know. I can't conceive what would have happened. More than anything else, you can turn off Jimmy Swagger or Billy Graham. You can turn off the street preacher. You can turn off your friend who witnesses to you. But you can't turn off the Holy Ghost, that inner voice, who's now moving you, you can't turn him off. He's the one who says God's holy, 
You're wicked, you're a sinner, and judgment is near because the Holy Ghost is said, His ministry is said to be that of convicting men of sin in the coming judgment. Where did our people, where did our American young people go wrong? What happened? How did they lose their way? I mean, what's the step that brings such wickedness on a society? The prophet Isaiah predicted a day was coming when our young people would faint and they would fall. And this is his prophecy. Even the young people shall faint, the young people shall be weary, the young man shall utterly fall. Isaiah 40, 30. That's called rock bottom. That's giving up on everything. And see, this is traced directly at a complete loss of faith. A loss of faith. Why? Isaiah, the same chapter, for your chapter. He's speaking to young people. And he's saying, young people, it's predicted that you're going to faint and be weary and fall. You're going to become wicked. And I'm going to tell you why. And God answered Isaiah. Why do you say in your heart, my way is hid from the Lord, and the justice due to me is passed over by God? God's not doing right by me. He said, I'm going to tell you why you're turning to sin. Tell you why you're so wicked now. Last night I preached about why Christian young people walk out on their father. And I'm going to tell you worldly young people why you're wicked. God saying it, not me. He said, you are wicked because you don't believe in me anymore. You don't believe I answer prayer. You don't believe I'm alive. And you say, God's not working in my behalf anymore. God's forsaken me. God hid his face for me. He knows where other people are, but he doesn't know where I am. God, this is God speaking. He said, why are you saying in your heart, the Lord's hidden himself from me? And why do you say God's not giving justice to me? He's not working in my behalf. The prophet was actually saying, you have no confidence anymore, respect for God. You've accused him of closing his eyes to your problems. You accuse the Lord of abandoning you and letting you alone to your own devices. You really don't believe that God is merciful or just. And all the prophets agree that Israel backslid and became wicked at the point they abandoned their trust in God. When they said, you, you know, the prophets came to them and they, God says, I'm going to have to judge you. and said, well, show us our sin. Show us our sin. And it's always been, you don't trust me anymore. You don't believe in me anymore. You have no confidence in the power of prayer. God said to these fainting, falling young people, Have you not known? Have you not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the Creator of the ends of the earth, He never faints, He's never weary, His understanding is unsearchable, He gives power to the faint, and to them that have no might, He increases strength. And God goes on, and He says, Who do you think created this world? How do you think this all came about? This is in Isaiah 40, 26. Who do you think created all this? Who brings out the stars in their massive numbers? Who knows every star by name? Who sits on the circle of the earth, ruling in greatness and power? He said, who do you think this is? Who do you think created you? And yet you say, I'm hidden from God. He doesn't see me anymore. He's not working in my behalf. To backslid in Israel, God said, I'm going to hide my face from you, for you become very wicked in my sight. And you'll become children in whom there is no faith. Children in whom there is no faith. Last summer I walked, when I was walking the streets of our cities, especially in New York, down to Greenwich Village, where young people come from all over the world. They're there from Germany, exchange students from Sweden, Switzerland, and Iron Curtain countries. And most of them speak English, at least broken English. You sit and try to communicate. And I tell you before God, I've sat sometimes almost all day trying to find a single young person who believed in God. One. said, I don't believe anymore. I, don't, I have no faith in God whatsoever. People, you're sitting here, you don't have the slightest idea, and every street worker knows what's going on out there. And I just spoke at a conference of street workers, and they confirmed just what our workers find now. We have over a thousand street workers in Europe. In the same report, the masses of young people have no faith at all. None. None. 
I go home at night and I pound a fist in the pillow and I cry. No faith. That's why you've become wicked. He said, you, you've given up on me. You don't even believe in me anymore. You've given up. Humanism blames God. For, for example, this is what the young people tell me. He said, well, what about the families and all those children starving in Africa? If God's just God, how can he allow it? You see, humanism blames God for the famines in the world and then has the audacity to suggest that man has more compassion than God. It's trying to tell you young people that are wicked and given up on your faith that God caused all that, and man has more compassion than man, even though God, they say, caused all this, which he didn't. And then man comes along and begins to feed them, build hospitals, and take care of them. And young people say, well, man is compassion, but God is mean. God is angry. Don't blame God for these starving children in Africa. You blame the world government. You blame the Ethiopian government who's taking millions of tons of food and selling it on the black market. You blame it for, you blame the Ethiopian government because they're mad at those rebels and they won't let food through those lines and they're, they're stuffing their own armies. You blame the corrupt politicians who spend trillions of dollars on defense and then throw a sop to poor nations. You know we figured it out that we could irrigate all of North Africa for the price of our moon landing. We could have irrigated all of North Africa. It's sheer mockery, it's dishonesty to blame God for the stupidity and blindness of men. And by the way, who, are they, who is it that is feeding the starving children? Who started this bandwagon to feed them now? Spirit-filled Christians! Young people, you've been listening to the devil's lie. He's led you to believe that God can't help you or hurt you. You see, God's not angry about sex and drugs and alcohol as much as he's angry about the unbelief. That's the corruption. That's the damning sin. It's always been from the very beginning. God hates these other deeds of the flesh, but the real damning sin is this unbelief in his majesty, that he's alive. And I believe there's only going to be a remnant saved. The wicked. Oh, there'll be an armies of the redeemed, but only a remnant of the wicked in this last hour. I don't see much in the Bible that offers hope for 100% repentance in America. The Bible predicts evil men are going to grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And I have a sense in me that we've gone too far already. And we're headed for imminent, near judgment about to break out, break forth from the throne. And what did Jesus have to say to young people just before judgment comes? He gave the message to Peter after God poured out his spirit. He, and you see, we preached the two parts of it. He said, repent and be baptized. And we stopped there. But there was a third part of Peter's message. Repent and be baptized. And save yourself from this wicked generation. Save yourself. Wake up. Be saved, baptized, and save yourself from this wicked generation. How you save yourself? If a man loses his life, he saves it. God poured out his spirit 2,000 years ago. I hear people say, well, God's... After awakening, after awakening, century after century after century, even though there are periods of darkness, ever since Pentecost, God's been calling, and we have people sitting around, just like people are waiting sitting around waiting for the temple to be built. I think a lot of Christians think, once the temple goes up, then I'm going to get holy, and I'm going to start praying and seeking God because I know the time is up. Well, the temple's been rebuilt for years. Jesus returned and rebuilt the house of David that was falling down. The temple's been built! This is the temple of the Holy Ghost. He said He doesn't dwell in temples made with men's hands. Oh, hell, I'm not looking for some temple in Jerusalem. 
Hallelujah to God. Nothing delays the coming of the Lord right now. The night's already been spent. The day of the Gentiles is over. The work of the Spirit nearly finished, and the hour of judgment's here. You know, the most incredulous man in eternity has got to be Jonah. How, do, how, do you, how, do you, how does he ever have it explained to him that an entire society would not repent with all that God baptized them with in the name of calls and appeals? The men of Sodom and Gomorrah will be incredulous, of course, but I think the most shocked man in eternity is Jonah. <sighs> Jonah will ask, what kind of society could it have been? What kind of society? I preach one German. And I saw men fall. I saw them run out in their barns and pull their animals out and cover them with sackcloth. I saw people throw sand in the air and moan and groan. I saw them reading in pain and repentance in the streets. I saw the heads of governments weeping like babies, and I preached one sermon. How do you explain that to Jonah? All right, now, this afternoon, I said, Lord, that's fine. That's a national appeal. That's a, that's a cry against American youth and their wickedness. But you see, up to this point, I've really not been preaching repentance. I've been preaching judgment. And simply, I've given you a warning from God that what's about to happen soon, and like Jonah, I've just told you time is up. And I'm going to tell you again. I'm telling you again, and I believe this, and I don't care what anyone says to me. I'll look you in the eye and tell you I've been on my knees until you know, until you can look me in the eyes and tell me you've been on your knees seeking God night and day. And if you seek God night and day, you're going to hear the same thing. The time is up. It's all over. Now, how's God going to judge America? I don't know. Jonah didn't know how God was going to destroy Nineveh. But you see, I believe judgment started against the music of devils ten years ago. I'm going to ask you young people now, you're still bound by your wickedness, where's Janis Joplin? Where's Jimi Hendrix? Where's the King of Rock, Elvis? Where's John Lennon? You see, God's already started pulling down the idols. It's already started. It's already happening. Now you know what God's going to do. And listen to me, Christian young people. I think the same thing happened to me that happened to Jimmy. I picked up Christianity today. And I looked at what is described as a group called Christian Punk Rock. And they were dressed in beads and belts. And what hurt me, it's the same, exactly same dress as I saw every summer when I walked the streets of San Francisco and I see 15 sadomasochists coming at me looking the same way with the chains and the belts and the studs and the painted face and the punk haircut and when I saw that picture and listened to some Americans applaud it, I fell on my knees and when I went in my study, God told me that those young men, if they want to live, had better get out of the church. They're going to die. They're going to die. Because God will not put up with it, young men. blind. How blind have we become? How blind are we? Brother Swaggart, the walls are down, the gates have fallen, and the enemy has moved in. The gates are down. I looked at that and I was on the streets of San Francisco. I heard one of the young men, his testimony was, Jimmy Swaggart's my favorite preacher. Well, then I say he's never, they've never heard a word he said. 
you young people had even listened to it. You see, I was reading this afternoon and I was reading about the idols of Israel. I was going through Jeremiah and Amos and Micah. And those idols, God said, they don't talk. You sit them up in front of you and they don't talk. They have no voice. And God spoke to my heart. David, the idols of your generation do talk. You have talking idols. Your idols are alive. I tremble so bad I can hardly talk. I do. Because God's about to move in the church. Because so few voices have taken a stand, we just passively sat by and let the walls go down and the gates down, let everything come in and trample over God's beautiful pasture. And so God said, you won't do it, I'll do it. I'll do it. And it's a shame that Jimmy Swagger can stand in a pulpit and take a stand. In my little way, I take a stand. And I hear people say you've got to have balance. Balance is the code word of a divided heart. You've got to have balance. God hates the word balance. You know what balance means? I want to hold my idol. God is looking for radical changes. Radical changes. Not balance. Radical changes. I want to get those boys put my arms around them. I want to take them to the streets of San Francisco. And I said, look, boys, look. Look what you're mocking. Look what you're imitating. And if Ananias and Sapphira can't even lie to the Holy Ghost and live, how are you going to mock them and live? And it's so bad, Brother Swaggart, we can't even discern when we see it in the church anymore. I have a sense in me that since America has made success and the almighty dollar its biggest idol, that's where God's going to move first. You know all God has to do, saints? All God has to do is speak the word and ten debtor nations refuse to pay their debt. And within two months, America's in chaos. Chaos. <laughs> now... And I just got this this afternoon. A personal word to all you young people who've been running from God. All of you who've quit on God and you're bound by your wickedness. I got a word for you. You can turn me off. My part, I don't expect many of you to hear. I don't expect many of you to listen. Because you see, you're a hundred times harder than anybody in Nineveh. Because he that's often reproved hardens his heart. And it's been the reproof that's hardened you. And you turned it off and turned it off. You put callous upon callous. I heard a young man say gross darkness is 144 times. 12 times 12. Gross darkness. 144 times worse. And you've got gross darkness in you. But I owe, to you, I owe it to you to tell you what the Lord told me. And I told you I'm not a prophet, but I've heard from God. And here's what I heard. You're not, you don't want to come to Jesus because of your friends and because you have no faith in God anymore. And it's party time all over America. That's all you hear. Party, party, party. It's party time. America's become one mad party. In Dallas, all last week they were advertising on the radio and television a big massive go to hell party. Go to hell party. And people were asking, what does it mean? And people said, just what it means. That's how bold we've become in our wickedness in America. Go to hell party. Who cares? Flaunt it in God's face. <laughs> it's party time. Easy sex, drugs, a lot of booze. Having a good time. Still hurting inside. 
but you've decided you're going to live it up and do your own thing and have your own way. Well, here's the Word of God for you. Listen, all I can do is give it to you. The time is coming soon. It's going to boil down to two simple choices, God or suicide. And I'm going to tell you how it happens. And I give you God's Word for it. And already thousands of young people are opting for suicide. All across the land right now. And here's, here's what happens. God says, I'm going to take away your peace. He said, I'm going to turn your pleasure into sorrow, your joy into tears. I'm going to turn your hopes into emptiness. And listen to this. O oh Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thy anger, lest you bring me to nothing. Unless you bring me to nothingness. And here's what God's doing. He's taking the thrill. I will look this congregation right in the eye. And I tell you, after all these years working with real crazed young people, <clears throat> ask this young street preacher over here that's teaching in the Bible school here. You look at him. They're supposed to be having fun. There's a sadness. There's an emptiness like it's never been there. There's no thrill. The thrill's gone. Sex hurts. Drugs dull. The booze makes them sick. The thrill is gone. There's nothing left. The peace is gone. The joy is gone. And finally, young man, you wake up one day. You said, I've tried it all. Nothing brings me pleasure. Sex is boring. The parties are dull. There's nothing left but nothingness. And the gun, the pill, and the knife. In North Dallas, the whole city shocked. Plano, horrible rate of suicide. I wrote a book about it three years ago, but I never, do, never did believe it would get as bad as it's gotten. It's boiled down to two choices. It's not God or parties. It's not God or my friends. It's not God or my drugs or alcohol. It's God or suicide. Oh, but there's, there, I, I forgot to give you this. For thou, Lord, are good, ready to forgive, and plenteous in mercy to them that call upon his name. Hallelujah. <laughs> Young people, Lord, told me to give you one final word of hope. Here it is, O oh Lord. I know that your way, I know that the ways of man, is, it, I know it's, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to know how to direct his own steps. So, O oh Lord, you correct me. Show me your mercy and not your anger, lest you bring me to nothingness. Hmm. I, I don't know why American Christians are sitting in front of comedy shows on television. Because there's nothing to laugh about now. I don't know how you can sit there and watch A-Team and all those other murderous things when God destroyed a whole nation and society for violence. I don't know how you can sit there in front of that talking, alive idol and sit there inside of worship. To that idol. Years ago, God told me if I'd get it out of my home, He would bless me and give me a ministry. And if I hadn't obeyed Him, I'd still be stuck in the hills of Pennsylvania trying to find my way through the hills because I spent that time in prayer. But then you see, I brought it back because it's sports and news. Oh, yeah, sports and news. And then soon I was laying down before that idol. And last month, when God said again, 
and we removed it. I saw something happen to my wife that I haven't seen in years. The glory. She's had the glory, but in such measure now. I saw God break loose, and I had five television sets in my home. You know, one in the kitchen where you can sit and eat, one in the bathroom where you can lay in the tub and watch, one in the bedroom. Isn't that awful? And I'm telling you now, Christians, this is a word for you. And I wasn't going to do it, but I have to do it. I'm going to burden my soul. The time's coming where Christians can use it only as Jimmy Swaggart's using it, and that's to preach the gospel. And you and I are going to have to pray and support it whether we see it or not. We're going to have to support it. I'm not asking you to take it out of your home. That's the word of the Holy Ghost. I can't tell you that. But I can tell you, you sit there and waste your hours. You waste time when you hear a message of judgment. You don't even know God. You're backslidden. You're so far from God, you can't even hear a word I'm saying tonight. Nothing I've said has made sense to you. I hear a trumpet blowing. I see God's heart. It's just the cup is just boiling over. And God said, that's it. Oh, it, it, it's incredible. And I, that's, that's what I don't think we understand. I said it last night. I believe Hosea, he, he's, he, he's prophesying in time of great prosperity. Gold and silver like stones. People living in palaces. And he's saying the same thing. It's all over. It's all over. He said, you delicate women who won't even go out and get your feet dirty are going to kill your babies and eat them. And within two years, they were eating their babies. Two years. Two years. Incredible. You can't imagine, can you, sitting in all this prosperity that God can suddenly move and it's all over. It's all over. But I can. And I have. Well, I've, I've obeyed the Lord. You know, I, I don't even know how to give an altar call in a time like this. I saw how God moved on Brother Swaggart last night. What an incredible gift to bring in the net. And maybe God will move in him in just a moment. I hope God does. But I, 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 I want to make one call, and I don't know what God will say to him. And I, I, I want to thank Brother Schweiger for letting me unburden my heart. Brother Schweiger preached like this, and he's not afraid of preaching like this. I'm going to say it one more time, Christians. It's all over. He said, now hide yourself. Gather together. Rejoice. He said, when you see all these things begin to happen, what's the message for us? Not to sit here sad. I'm talking about, I'm talking to the wicked tonight. What should the Christian be doing? We're to look up and rejoice before redemption is drawing nigh. Glory to God. I'm not stalling. I'm just trying to get the mind of God now. And I feel... Like, I want to ask young people here in this audience and wherever I'm being seen right now. Hmm. All the young people that are on the edge. You're on the edge. You're being attracted by the very thing I'm talking about. Your faith is very shaky. And you're starting to watch the cassettes. You're starting to like it. You're saying, that's not so bad. And you're saying, others are doing it. And little by little, your fire is going out and you're getting colder and colder and colder. And your love for Jesus is dying in the process. I want to ask you to, to stay in your seat. I'm going to ask you the second time. The first appeal, though, is for young people here in the audience and wherever I'm heard who, and I don't remember ever doing this before in my lifetime, not this way. You have to admit, David, 
when you were preaching about wicked youth, I had to say, that's me. I'm wicked. There's wickedness in me. There's sin in me. Wicked. Now that's something for a preacher to get up and say, admit you're wicked and get up and come down here and say, oh God, have mercy on me lest you bring me to nothingness. And you've probably already been brought to nothingness, emptiness. I'm going to ask you, I'm not even going to pray. I'm just going to ask you to get up. Come up here and take me by the hand. I'm going to ask God to bind the devil that's trying to destroy your soul. And I want to take dominion over that thing in your life right now. The devil's been trying to tear your life apart. And I know I have his mind right now. There's some young people here right now. And if you're, you're watching, you can get right up and go to the pastor or your leaders. And I want those leaders and others to stand right in front. Stand right beside the screen. And you get up and you go up and take hands, lay hold of them, take dominion in Jesus' name. And I want everybody in this audience, I don't care what your age is, I don't care if you're a grandfather. Say, David, I've got wickedness in me, and I know God's going to judge. And I know I'm about to lose my faith forever. Get up. And come and take me by the hand right now, and I'm going to ask God to take dominion in Jesus' name. Get up. Last night, I felt that we were
in the presence of God in a way that may be. I'd never since before. I told Francis when the service was over at the close of Dave's message. I felt a pathos. I felt a burden for our nation. I felt like I was standing on holy ground. His presence, and I knew this was the place where love abounds. For this is a temple, Jehovah God. Abides here, for we are standing in His presence on holy ground. We are standing. There is so much joy for yon all nation. At his feet, peace of mind can still be found. have a need, I know he has the answer, oh reach out and claim it, for you are standing on hold.
Stay.